to continue our discussion of uh, how the political kind of played into the economic trends that we've been talking about, we're going to take the example of Chile. Uh, so here's a map of the nation of Chile, just to give you a sense of its general geography, some of its major cities. Uh, the photograph is of the city of Santiago, which is the capital. If any of you have been to Santiago, um, I would love to talk to you more about it because it's a place that I would very much uh, like to visit, but I haven't been able to get to yet. In many ways, Chile um, had a lot of similarities to the United States in terms of its political development and its relative political and economic stability. Um, so unlike many other Latin American nations, Chilean politics were stable, uh, more or less, from the time of its independence through um, the early 20th century and the Depression. And even then, um, stability continued to mark uh, what was going on in Chile. So these three guys, Joaquin Prieto, Manuel Bulnes, and Manuel Montt, um, each held power for a 10-year period. Uh, presidents were in power for 10 years. Uh, in Chile since the uh, independence, or since its independence, I should say. Um, so uh, Prieto was president in the 1830s, Bulnes in the 1840s, and Mont in the 1850s. These guys, uh, as you may guess, were fairly conservative in terms of their politics, um, but in terms of how they actually governed, they were quite pragmatic, and they could actually have kind of liberal leanings in terms of um, providing um, certain freedoms, freedom of thought, free, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, you know, the things that were liberal ideals of the 19th century, they were things they supported. And because they did, um, they could count on relative peace within the populace and relative stability for uh, passing power from one to the next. Now, in terms of electoral politics, uh, elections took place, but there were great limits on who could vote. You know, it was men who held property, uh, and there was even a pretty high threshold on how much property you had to hold, at least early on, uh, in Chile to be able to vote. So it wasn't truly an open democracy, but it had democratic trappings, and certainly a republic with the legislature, representatives from around the nation uh, to be in that body, to pass laws with the president as the guy in charge. Also, the economy was relatively stable. We've talked about guano and nitrates, and you've seen the picture of the guy above my head before. Um, he was John Thomas North, who was also known as the nitrate king, or at least he fashioned himself as such. Um, but he was a British um, investor who was able to run the nitrates operations in northern Chile, in the 19th century. This was good in terms of the notion of stability, meaning that the Chilean government had a steady, steady stream of income going to support its initiatives. We've talked about the political stability that also followed. In terms of actually providing resources though um, and incomes for the Chilean people, um, this pattern of developing nitrates did very little. So this is a key difference between the United States and Chile in the 19th century, while, whereas the United States was industrializing and was becoming in and of itself a power that uh, fostered the development of multinational corporations that went outside of the United States and brought profits in from outside. Chile was one of these nations that, despite its prosperity, um, had resources and cheap labor that nations like Great Britain in the 19th century and then the United States, through its multinationals in the 20th, um, were able to take advantage of. Uh, another similarity between the U.S. and Chile in the 19th century were its relations with its indigenous people. Um, across Latin America, we've seen cases where indigenous people were a large proportion of the overall population, as was the case in Guatemala, as is the case in Mexico, especially southern Mexico. Um, we could go on and on with that list. There's been this issue of trying to incorporate indigenous people into mainstream politics, into mainstream ways of doing things. In Chile, it was a little different because the Mapuches lived in places that until the 
um, mid 19th century, other Chileans didn't really want to inhabit or didn't want to control. So this is kind of like westward expansion in the United States where there were Indian wars, uh, so-called, to subjugate and uh, place indigenous peoples on reservations. This is a big part of New Mexico's history. Um, similarly, for the Mapuche, they waged wars against uh, the Chilean military in the late 19th century until finally coming to an accord that allowed them to keep um, some chunks of their homeland, uh, but having to recognize the authority of the Chilean state. But we have already discussed uh, the ways in which they've been able to maintain some cultural autonomy and resilience as well. This is an odd thing, the ultramontane conflict. This helps us understand, uh, or at least gives us a way to think about why liberal conservative conflicts, um, or at least competition, didn't become open conflicts and even war in Chile the way that they did in other places across Latin America. So for example, in Mexico, there was a bloody three-year war starting in 1857 called the War of the Reform, or La Reforma, that uh, pitted liberals against conservatives. And something we mentioned during the section on Latin American history, uh, across the region, liberal politicians rose to prominence in the 1850s. Chile was much the same, except also um, at that time, Pope Pius IX had become what has been dubbed ultramontane, meaning he was trying to bring all of the bishops all across the world and everyone else in the church, all of the priests, you know, down to the Catholic membership um, into orthodoxy, into line with what he saw fit. Um, he saw himself as infallible. Um, he was one that preached the uh, notion of papal infallibility, meaning he can't make a mistake. He's ordained of God. His word is God's word, essentially. And he issued um, in 1864 what was called the Syllabus of Errors. Let me close that. The Syllabus of Errors was essentially saying, the church has been too liberal on a lot of things. Um, we're going to walk that all back. Um, so as you can get a sense of from this cartoon, my head might be cutting off the caption. The caption said, the Pope's mad bull. Um, papal bulls were declarations issued by the Pope. And so it's saying, this one's crazy. Um, the Pope is attacking everything that equals progress, um, common sense, toleration, civil and li religious liberty. The Pope essentially said separation of church and state. Yeah, that was a mistake. Um, the church needs to be politically involved and it needs to be politically powerful. Both conservatives and liberals in Chile opposed this generally. There are some people who didn't, some uh, clerics and others um, that created a bit of a, a conflict within Chilean politics for a short time in the 1860s. But by and large, this was something that liberals and conservatives could get behind. And when uh, Jose Joaquin Perez was in line to be elected um, for the next term in the presidency, his predecessor, Manuel Montt, um, gave him his stamp of approval, even though they were from different political backgrounds and parties. Um, and my wife loves me. So um, even, even though they were from different political backgrounds and parties, um, a conservative then would support a liberal coming to power because pragmatically they realized we need to maintain peace and get along in order for all of us who are all elites essentially to maintain our hold on power. Um, so during uh, Perez's term in office in 1863, there was a major fire at um, the Jesuit Cathedral in Santiago, and that's what the painting depicts. Um, there were a, a few thousand people uh, who had gathered to light lamps for the month of Mary there. And because of the large numbers of people, because of the wood used in the building, um, it turned into a conflagration that killed about 2,000 people, mostly women and children. Um, so this was something that uh, the Chilean government uh, decided you know, kind of in a, a liberal turn that a city like Santiago, the government nationally, needs to provide better services for its people, needs to have a fire department, needs to have certain codes for building so that these kinds of things don't happen again. Um, also during, uh, actually right after Perez's um, term in office under his predecessor, a new constitution was put in place uh, 
that was amended to prevent presidents from serving consecutive terms in office. So it was meant to limit the power of just one person. Um, in 1874, a couple of amendments were added that um, made government ministers, so in the president's cabinet, more accountable to the legislature in Chile. All of these things were put in place um, to um, kind of spread power around among the elites. Um, so I say it that way because this wasn't about democracy. This wasn't about opening, opening up the channels of power and participation to all of the Chilean people, but instead it was about those of us who are in power, who have some wealth and education and that kind of background and who are essentially white, um, we will be able to make sure that none of us uh, runs roughshod over the others. Um, so it has that great limitation, but it also kind of much like the United States um, also held the promise of, of this political stability and economic stability um, and more democratic options in the future. I want to take a break right here for just a second um, and bring this up into the 20th century. So Chile continued a similar pattern of stability, of sharing power, and even of um, leaving room for opposition parties. So there was no two-party system in Chile. In fact, the United States is probably the most entrenched two-party system anywhere in the world that has a democratic system. Most others follow proportional representation, which means that uh, there could be you know, upwards of five seven, ten political parties that all have a stake um, in the political process because they will get seats in the legislature proportionately depending on how the votes go. Um, in Chile, this meant that the Communist Party began to flourish by the early 20th century, as was the case in many other places around the world. I mean, even in the United States, um, the U.S. Communist Party was never a major party. It didn't challenge the two-party dominance. Um, but it uh, was very vocal and had a place in early 20th century politics as well, especially before the Cold War. Um, it was pretty much uh, went on the underground after that. Uh, but I say all of that just to point out that in Chile, although there was kind of this theory, especially by the Cold War, and this was Marxist theory, that the Communist Party and communism would be an international movement. Um, in Chile, it was a domestic one. It was something that was, or it was a party, I should say, that was interested in coalition building, in uh, making compromises, building consensus, and taking part in the process um, as it existed. And that was the case since its earliest days in the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s. Um, we've mentioned populism, I think, before, uh, but following World War II, and, as, and I guess during World War II and the Depression, uh, populist leaders like um, we have here Juan Perón and Evita um, in Argentina. We have Getulio Vargas, who we saw with his hand covered with oil a minute ago. Here's Lázaro Cárdenas, who was the uh, Mexican oil expropriator. And we have Jorge Eliezer Gaitán um, in Colombia. All of these men um, were populist leaders in that they appealed directly to the people. They gave rousing speeches, they went on radio, um, not so much television, that was brand new toward the end of the, the height of populism in Latin America. Um, but they made a lot of promises, many of which they kept. I mean, uh, Perón um, really supported urban laborers. That was kind of the backbone of his coalition and his movement. Um, Vargas did much the same. At the same time, they consolidated their power in a very authoritarian way. Um, and so I think the uh, populist governments here, or these populist leaders, are probably one of the most blatant direct examples of that melding of authoritarianism and democracy. They were authoritarian leaders who came to power through democratic means and who kept in place essentially all of the democratic systems in their nations. Um, also, many of them were corporatists. That doesn't mean that they uh, were CEOs of corporations or uh, were all about big business, although many of them may have supported large corporations in terms of uh, economic development. Corporatism, when thinking about the political and economic system, is a process of making everything dependent on the state or on the federal government. Um, so, for example, Getulio Vargas, um, 
during his Estado Novo, or the New State, um, which started in 1937 and went through the end of his term um, in the early 40s. It was a highly authoritarian system in terms of placing more and more power in the presidency and his administration, um, but it also created official unions for workers. It created an official agrarian union to try to look at um, land issues in terms not only of redistribution, but of development of crops and that sort of thing. But all social reforms were dependent on the government, which meant that the power of the president was enhanced. Now in Chile, this guy, um, the guy on the left, Carlos Ibanez del Campo, he was a military man, as you can see and get a sense of, um, who was sort of Chile's populist. Um, he was a person who would appeal to popular notions in order to maintain his power and get into power, but he was even greater in terms of his authoritarian leanings in that he came to power first through a coup, uh, a military coup against the elected president Arturo Alessandri, who is pictured here. Um, Alessandri served um, in the 20s. He was uh, ousted in 1927 and Campo took over as president. Um, he was in that position from 1927 to 1931 and then again from 1952 to 1958. In the interim though, he was always behind the scenes pulling the strings on what was going on politically in Chile. Um, so he, uh, let's see. So Ibanez would place different people, even civilians at times in the presidency, kind of orchestrate their placement on the ballot and again, people voted, but this was something that could be manipulated and was um, in order to get his, uh, his person in power. Um, during the Depression, he kind of fell out of favor, and Alessandri actually won election again, despite uh, his efforts at controlling things. Um, and Alessandri was the one who was credited with helping Chile uh, ride out the Depression. Um, still, though, Ibanez del Campo was uh, in Alessandri's cabinet um, as his minister of war, and through that post, he was able to uh, wield some power. Um, when he came back to power, um, not personally, but through one of his puppets after Alessandri's presidency, um, he became increasingly more uh, harsh on opposition parties. Uh, members of opposition parties were exiled. Um, by 1952, he decided to run for the presidency again, and he uh, campaigned on the notion of being the quote-unquote general of hope, who would sweep corruption out of Chile with his broom. Um, it worked. Uh, he had that populist appeal still, but in the 50s, economic uh, issues took a downturn in Chile. Um, inflation ran rampant by 1955. It was about 85%. Um, and with foreign aid, um, it dropped to 33%. So he was someone who could appeal to the people, get some things done, but for the first time in Chilean history, he was an example of a destabilizing force in the political system. After his term, or his term, after he died um, and no longer had a stronghold on Chile's politics, um, elections once again became um, more open, or not once again, but they became more open um, and a lot more competitive. So in 1958 then, uh, after, uh, after Ibanez's last term, um, these guys were all running uh, for the presidency of Chile. Um, that year, Jorge Alessandri, and the, the names over here are corresponding to the photos. So we have Alessandri, Allende, Eduardo Frey, and uh, Tomic right here. Um, they all were somewhere along that left-right continuum. Alessandri was the son of Arturo. Um, he was the kind of center right, uh, well, a little bit more than more right than center um, candidate that year, and he won election in 1958. Salvador Allende was a Marxist, openly socialist, um, so far to the left candidate. 
Um, Allende ended up with 28.9% of the vote that year. Um, Frey, who was a Christian Democrat, uh, got 20.7%, and the remaining 18.8% were split between Tomic and um, a radical party candidate. And so uh, the point here is that um, Chilean elections offered a lot of different options for uh, Chilean people. Um, the parties represented by those numbers were able to take those proportions to the legislature um, and coalition governments had to be formed. Um, so this was not a, an opportunity for, uh, at least at this point, for Alessandri Allende or any of these guys um, to try to walk away um, uh, with the vote and take complete power for themselves. Um, I found this image online of uh, Frey, but this is a quote from him when he was running for office. Uh, and he was trying to kind of tread in between the capitalist communist rhetoric of the Cold War um, with this quote, saying that man is sacred and is better than the system. Um, he ended up uh, gaining election after Alessandri, but then in 1970, um, after some changes had taken place in the 60s, um, and I should step that back one more, in 1949, women were given the vote in Chile. Uh, by 1963, then, about 2.5 million people could vote. So that was up from only about 500,000 in 1938. Um, so what we're getting at here is there had been large advances in terms of actually opening the democratic process to the Chilean people. There were new, diff new and different coalitions that had formed in Chilean politics by the 60s. Um, conservative and um, what were dubbed liberal um, parties were on the right. The radicals tended to be centrists and opportunists, which doesn't sound like you know radicals, but they, <laughs> they tended to be centrists. And the Popular Unity Coalition was the one that was headed in the 60s and 70s by Salvador Allende. So this was one on the left. This was a, a Marxist coalition. In 1970, um, running on that Popular Unity platform, um, uh, Salvador Allende won the election. Uh, but to give you the numbers again, so remember the, the way that these kind of proportional representation kinds of systems work, um, Allende won the vote um, with 36.3%. Alessandri had 34.9%. Tomic had 27.8%. They were all running against each other again um, at that time. So this was the only time that a Marxist candidate had ever won democratically uh, an election, a national election in Latin America. Um, and it was something that threatened the United States and multinational corporations greatly, as we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but it's also important to realize how divided Chilean politics was. You know, this isn't some clear mandate that the Marxists are the majority. There were a lot of people, urban workers, for example, and um, a lot of the farmers in Chile who had thrown their support behind Salvador Allende. Most of the business leaders, however, did not. Um, and certainly the Nixon administration did not. Here we have uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, um, who was his Secretary of State, um, who wielded an inordinate amount of power in the Nixon administration and has influenced American politics and foreign policy for uh, pretty negative ends, actually, uh, across the world um, in terms of thinking about how people in other countries are treated by U.S. policies. You see all these different companies represented on this slide. So we have Purina, we have Ford, we have ITT. Um, which was a, a telephone uh, technology company at the time. Um, we also have the Anaconda Copper Mining Company and Kennecott, um, those two below the, the photograph. Um, copper mining was kind of the thing in Chile. These other companies had large stakes of uh, the Chilean economy as well. But that problem, once again, going back even to the nitrates of the 19th century, the Chile's economy was not really developed or managed or run by Chileans uh, or even by companies that would keep the profits in Chile. This was something that these companies and the Nixon administration kind of uh, in connection with them uh, realized that Salvador Allende's presidency might threaten uh, 
their ability to continue business as usual because of the promise of Marxism, because of the idea that um, giving the means of production to the workers and allowing them to uh, share in all of the profits of the labors of, of factory work or whatever it was, um, you know, all of these theoretical ideas greatly threaten these companies. And so uh, after, you know, very vocally and loudly, um, you know, screaming that son of a bitch, that son of a bitch, after he learned that Allende had won the presidency, Nixon and Kissinger focused on a program that they called Making Chile's Economy Scream. Um, they put sanctions, they tightened the screws down on uh, trade with Chile um, in order to prevent Allende from having any resources to enact any of the reforms, uh, social reforms and uh, welfare types of reforms for the Chilean people um, that he had promised them, you know, again, making, making it look that um, his brand of socialism had failed. And when it all came down to it, it was a CIA-sponsored coup that removed uh, Allende from power and placed uh, Augusto Pinochet squinting right here in the middle. Um, you rarely see him without sunglasses in his photographs. There's a rare one. Um, put him in power uh, for... Uh, the next couple of decades until 1990. Uh, it's this cartoon here, you can see it was September 11th, 1973 that this coup took place. Uh, there's still uh, very heated debates about whether or not Allende killed himself in the National Palace or whether he was killed. This is the bombing of the National Palace um, on that day. Um, but the dictatorship run by Pinochet that followed was highly repressive. Um, it was part of the kind of central core of the U.S. sponsored Operation Condor that sought to crack down on political opposition, on Marxists, or on anyone who could be labeled subversive. You know, people were disappeared. They were thrown out of airplanes into the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, very horrible, dark stuff. And that's not even talking about the torture and um, everything else. So unfortunately, once again, um, it was that U.S. intervention that damaged uh, Chile's economic and political system. We're going to kind of take a huge jump, um, but, but not so huge. There were a lot of things that went into um, bringing Pinochet out of power and returning democracy to Chile in 1990. But some of that, and much of that, was the efforts of just common folk to get out from under the prohibitions on free speech and on uh, uh, political opposition. One of the ways that uh, many women did that in the 1980s was by creating these patchwork quilts called arpilleras um, that depicted sometimes family members who had been disappeared. This one says, uh, we can't even offer our opinion. Um, so you see the, the women standing out there on the street as they're watching someone uh, arrested yelling stop, you know, with the guns drawn um, on the street. But this was a way of kind of putting out in the open things that people couldn't talk about, but they knew that were going on during the dictatorship. Little by little, um, the uh, dictator's power was whittled away um, and a democratic system re returned by the 1990s. But it was once again one that was pretty neoliberal. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means in a second. But it gave a lot of power back to companies like Anaconda and Kennecott to continue to extract resources from Chile, make a large profit, and not put much back, if anything, uh, to the Chilean economy. In the meantime, offering loans through the IMF and the World Bank with uh, pretty damaging terms for the actual people of Chile. The other people here are those who are either the current president of Chile, that's uh, Michelle Bachelet. Um, she is the current president of Chile, and if you click on uh, the image of her there, you'll go to a New York Times story from last June, I believe, it's either June or July, um, talking about her as the last woman standing in Latin America. Um, there were, uh, including her, three female presidents in the Southern Cone, until Dilma Rousseff in Brazil was impeached and Christina Kirchner came under fire uh, for corruption charges and lost, um, excuse me, lost her bid at re-election to um, a kind of center-right technocrat uh, 
um, in Argentina. Um, these women were part of that kind of turn toward the left um, in the early uh, 21st century, meaning um, not out and out Marxism. Um, Salvador Allende was kind of the, the example of that or something like the Cuban revolution where there's kind of a restructuring and placing a, a different way of doing the economy on the country. But instead, these were people who were looking at social welfare systems for the people of their countries, trying to um, end illiteracy, end poverty, using the government to do those sorts of things. Um, so uh, Bachelet will certainly be replaced um, because she's not able to run for re-election. Um, she's become kind of unpopular in Chile as of late. Um, and has herself faced some corruption scandals. Uh, so those who are running for the presidency and the first round of elections just took place last Sunday on the 19th are Sebastián Piñera, Beatriz Sánchez, and Alejandro uh, Guillermo. Um, I think I misspelled Guillermo's name on there. I apologize. There's another I between that last L and E. Um, but um, in that election, Piñera took away about... Um, 37% uh, of the vote compared to 22-ish for uh, Guillermo and about 20 for um, Beatriz Sanchez. And there were a couple of others who are also running. But what that means under the current um, uh, election laws in Chile, um, the election isn't just given to Piñera. Um, now there has to be a runoff. So because he didn't get 50%, had he got 51% of the vote the first time around, he would have just won. But because he didn't, now he and uh, Guillermo are going to have uh, another face-off um, in a few weeks, a second round of elections to see who will actually become president. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see. Piñera is a kind of neoliberal reformer. He had been president before in the earlier 2000s. Um, he's a strong businessman, um, kind of in, along those lines. Um, Guillermo and Sanchez both lean more to the left, and so there is some speculation that their respective parties might come together to both vote for Guillermo. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. The last couple slides, just quickly before we end this presentation, um, in the context of the economics and politics that we've been talking about, um, I wanted to just bring back those um, fights over um, water. So here's uh, another protest. It wasn't just in Bolivia, although that was kind of the most uh, prominent and became the most high profile of these cases. Uh, but in trying to develop transportation networks that would uh, traverse much of Latin America, as is shown on that 1999 map, um, there are efforts to nationalize some of these things but because of what has happened with things like Petrobras and Pemex, um, nationalization of industries has sort of fallen out of favor, especially in terms of getting loans and support uh, to develop industries from the IMF or the World Bank. And uh, private corporations are finding then that they can step into that vacuum to build roads, to build infrastructure, um, to privatize water, um, to make a profit. But again, the problem is, and these are, as you can probably tell, no easy solutions to the kinds of problems that Latin American nations are trying to deal with here, especially within that worldwide context of thinking about them as being on the economic periphery uh, that we saw with dependency theory. Um, of course, the people are getting hurt by many of these choices and many of these outcomes, but what can be done? Neoliberalism, um, was supposed to have been this promise of privatizing everything, getting back to free trade. Um, and we've talked about this before, so I'll just let you read through the list there. Um, but sort of, you know, again, getting back to the good old days of United Fruit. Um, and so this is championed by people who were benefiting from companies like United Fruit or like the Anaconda Company um, in terms of copper that held monopolies in their respective industries in certain countries. Um, and made a huge profit. Their um, sort of claim is that their prosperity will trickle down, but the problem is without some way of making that happen, it's not going to happen. Um, if they can evade taxes, for example, and don't have to 
um, invest into the uh, livelihood of the people and the nations that they're operating in, it doesn't work out that way. Um, and so because of some of the shortcomings of these other attempts at trying to address issues of poverty, trying to come out of that cycle of dependency, neoliberalism has found a space to, uh, and it's called neoliberalism because it's the new liberalism. It's the new version of the same old thing. Um, it's back again. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what will happen because since 2007, eight, when we had the economic downturn in our own uh, country with the housing bubble, um, that was another instance of these neoliberal policies having gone bad. There was a, a switch to try to um, regulate the worst of that. But now we see with the current administration, a shift back in the other direction. Um, so once again, it'll be interesting um, to see what actually comes of that. A couple of things we didn't talk about this semester much was NAFTA. This is something the current administration is trying to kill, calling it a bad deal for, um, for Americans. What it was supposed to do was um, create a free trade zone across North America. And it did, I mean, to all intents and purposes. But the problem was... Um, it created the rise of what are called maquiladora industries. So um, companies, uh, sometimes technology companies or a company like Ford Motor Company can put its production plant right on the Mexican side of the border in a place like Ciudad Juarez and um, get the best of all worlds because they can move their parts and their goods across the border um, with tax-free. They can get the cheapest labor while getting kind of the best manufacturing of the component parts of their cars. What has happened, instead of stemming the tide of migration, NAFTA actually um, kind of intensified it during the 90s and early years of the 2000s. Despite all of the kind of heated rhetoric, though, um, illegal immigration or um, illegal crossings of the border have actually been on the decline um, even before the militarization uh, and even without a new wall. Um, if you click on this link, um, you can read more about the EZLN or the New Zapatista movement um, that rose against the uh, Mexican government when NAFTA was passed and, and when it was going to, to go into effect, I should say, on the 1st of January, 1994. The Zapatistas, they still exist and they are an interesting example of a very radical kind of democracy in which um, positions of power within the Zapatista structure and system rotate out often. Um, women have had a much more strong say politically. Um, these are mostly Mayan people or people of different indigenous ancestries from the, the set, uh, section of Mexico or the state of Mexico called Chiapas um, in the south. And uh, they are actually putting up a... Uh, or supporting, I should say, a female indigenous candidate for the presidency of Mexico in 2018. Um, so there will be another uh, political contest that will be very interesting to see what happens uh, going forward there. So wrapping things up, um, I think hopefully we've tied together many of the strands that we've brought up over the course of the term in these two uh, video presentations uh, that we looked at in this unit. But we also have to think about you know, along with everything that I've just brought up, um, Latin American nations have a lot of things that they're still dealing with. So you see this cartoon, the difference or the gap between truth and reconciliation. Um, how do you put back together a system that has been upended by a violent dictatorship that disappeared, tortured, and killed people? There are these truth commissions, but how do they get to actual reconciliation? How do they get justice? That's a question, as we brought up uh, a few different times, that hasn't really been answered. Here are the, the kind of good old boys of the new left. Two of them have uh, passed away since that photograph was taken. We have Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro. Um, then Ivo Morales of Bolivia and, um, um, I'm forgetting his first name, but Correa of Ecuador. They were people who were populist leaders who promised social reforms for indigenous peoples, and um, they were able to deliver in a lot of ways. But as we also know, 
in the case of Castro and Chavez specifically, they were highly authoritarian um, and uh, denied uh, people civil rights on a regular basis. Uh, Morales and Correa have done, or Rafael Correa, um, are guilty of that to a lesser degree, but they're also now being charged with um, kind of selling out um, their original promises. Um, Morales in Bolivia is trying to change the constitution so that he can run again. Um, he's been elected, I think this might be his third term already, he's trying to go for a fourth um, in the next couple of years. And even though the Supreme Court said that wasn't okay, it looks like he's trying to use um, not judicial but legislative um, pathways toward overriding the court and getting his way anyway. So there are these, again, authoritarian tendencies that we're having to reckon with, even as these nations are trying to figure out how to reconcile these dark pasts and deal with the problems of neoliberal economics. How do we deal with these things? Um, how do we reach out? How do we make sure that the cultures and histories of vibrant Latin American peoples uh, remain protected? These are the difficult questions that we'll still be working on uh, for years to come.